Hi, my name is Yasmin Terehi. I recently completed my two-month transformational leadership program and the results were powerful. If you want to live an exciting life and fulfill your highest potential in 2023 and beyond, I have an incredible opportunity for only a few more individuals to join the next cohort. I will personally be coaching a small group on how to discover and clear your limiting beliefs, how to manage your energy instead of your time, how to tap into the power of your intuition, and how to use discernment so that you can start living a life full of ease, abundance, and flow. As someone who has helped countless entrepreneurs and CEOs open doors of possibility they never thought existed, I can tell you that this strategy will completely transform your life. The best part, you'll 10X your output and unlock your creative genius. I'll work with you weekly to overcome your limiting beliefs and transform that into a new self-concept. I'll teach you how to create clarity, systems and processes, and I'll also help you develop your intuition. You'll get access to some of the best material that will also help you manage your energy, and you'll get access to guided meditations that are not available anywhere else. This method is so effective. If you'd like to join the waitlist, you can find the link in the show notes or navigate to www.yasmintarehi.com backslash gateways hyphen to hyphen awakening backslash. Hi, my name is Yasmin Terehi, and this is Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one conversations with leading experts in wellness, well-being, and spirituality. Today's episode is about women's health and specifically cervical health with Danelle Barbara Randall. Danelle's a woman's integrative health coach and wellness educator and guide that specializes in cervical health and pelvic well being. Her work focuses on utilizing habit and behavior change through lifestyle medicine to support the cervix and body as a whole to heal and regenerate all on its own. She also has her master's in integrative health, and she's the author of the book, Informed, Aware, Empowered, A Self-Guided Journey to Clear Paps. And you can check out her website, cervicalwellness.com. She hosts many free and uh, she has a lot of paid resources to also help guide women on the path of healing. And we'll share this in the show notes. All right. Welcome to the show, Danelle. Hi, Yasmin. I'm excited to be here. So Danelle, to kick it off, you say that there's a revolution happening in women's health. Can you share why? Mm. Yeah, this is something that I've observed over the last, I'd say, 10 years or so, really starting from when I was in the trenches, you could say, of my own pelvic healing journey. I had seven years of abnormal pap smears. And when I started to really think about wanting to support myself in healing abnormal pap smears, there really wasn't much conversation around you know, the womb or female hormones or um, really much, many resources out there regarding how we as women can really take back the reins and um, take care of our bodies in the way that we need to heal ourselves instead of just handing over all the power to the gynecologist. And so, you know, as I have been on my own healing journey and then started my business, Cervical Wellness, seven years ago, I have seen through social media primarily just this incredible uptick of awareness and you know sharing of resources and publishing of books and more and more podcasts are coming out, uh, like podcasts shows about women's reproductive health, women's reproductive wellness. And, you know, it's really incredible to me just to witness even in my own life of my friend's base or even my family, just this awareness that has broadened regarding how we as women can take care of our female bodies, how we can utilize Um, tools such as herbs or even mindfulness um, or self-touch to support ourselves in ways that modern gynecology has kind of faltered on. And so, you know, I really 
believe that there is a revolution happening within the women's health field, and it's very grassroots. It is not happening in the medical fields, but it's happening through the women themselves, through resource sharing, through community gathering, and you know, women's circles, and um, you know, an increase in doulas and midwives herbalism, these sorts of things, a reclamation of our innate ability to help our bodies heal and to help each other in community through the sharing of education and information. Um, And the final piece that I've noticed is a large percentage of the women that I work with in cervical wellness in my one-on-one group and group coaching containers is as they start to deepen their relationship with their body and connect to their, their pelvis and remember what it's like to take care of themselves. The flame of inspiration is ignited within them to then be a torch bearer for this work as well. And so I've really seen a ripple of impact that, you know, these conversations and like I said, resource sharing and information sharing has had on the women in a global capacity. And it makes me really excited because uh, from what I know of modern gynecology and the history of the foundation of that field of medicine is there's a lot of healing that needs to be done in the way that we approach female reproductive anatomy and just the female body in general. And we, the women, are really doing that for ourselves. Danelle, that's so beautiful. I think for sure that it feels like there's a lot more information uh, coming out on women's health. And the knowledge sharing that's happening right now is so awesome. And it also feels like we're just getting started, right? <laughs> feels like yeah, totally. there's, right? there's so little information still available to women. I mean, a lot of people probably have never really even heard some of these terms. So maybe even before we continue, could you actually share what is the cervix? Um, mm. What is what is the cervix and what is you know pelvic well-being? What does that mean? <laughs> Yes. Yes. So cervix is actually a part of our female reproductive anatomy. So the cervix is a part of the uterus. So like the uterus as an organ, uh, the cervix is a part of it. And it is the tip of the uterus that is exposed in the vaginal canal. So when something penetrates the vaginal canal or like when we have a pap smear done or gynecological exam, what they, what you feel when something penetrates you or what they're examining in these exams is actually the face of the cervix. So the cervix is called the neck of the uterus. So the uterus is shaped like an upside down pear and the cervix is like the bottom most section of the pear shaped uterus. Um, the cervix is pretty thick. It's about two, three inches thick, but the part of the cervix that I focus my work on is again called the face of the cervix, which is the part of the cervix exposed in the vaginal canal. And, you know, for many of us, with female anatomy, like we've, we've never heard of this place until something is quote wrong there. Oftentimes women will hear about the cervix if they have an abnormal pap smear or if they are in labor and, you know, the doctor says your cervix isn't dilating or whatnot. It's like, there's always something wrong associated with it. And what I want to bring to the forefront is actually this place in our body is a very sensitive and I'm going to just name like intelligent place that when we have a connection with the deep pelvis or have pelvic well-being, deep pelvis meaning the cervix because it is really like the most inner place of our pelvis is like the, it's deep inside it's like kind of like dark and hidden that when we foster a connection with our pelvis as women, bring our awareness from our brain, because most of us live 
our lives very in like the top most portion of our body. Like we're very cerebral, mental. Maybe we feel our heart sometimes when we're like stressed out or have a strong emotion. But oftentimes I'd say nine out of 10 of us do not have any sort of awareness in our pelvis. So like bringing our our conscious awareness and our mind down into our pelvis. And when we do this, we can begin to make changes in our life to bring like pleasure and health and vitality to this place. And so this is what I mean by pelvic well-being. Our female reproductive organs aren't just for you know, like conceiving and um, making babies to then birth into the world. Our ovaries and our uterus and our cervix and the vaginal canal and the vulva, like these are all very sensational places within us. And I mean sensational, um, meaning that we have like a sensory, a sensory experience And the ovaries are part of the endocrine system, which the hormonal system of our body is deeply intertwined to our mood, to uh, how we uh, feel and interact into the world. And so by inviting women to bring our conscious awareness down into our pelvis and to like begin to have a relationship here uh, to think about how we are acting and living and behaving in our life with a focus being on our pelvis, we then can cultivate or like create in our life this sense of pelvic well-being. And pelvic well-being is our thoughts, our feelings, and our relationship to this place in our body, our pelvic bowl. And unfortunately for most women, myself included, prior to having had this awareness and, you know, my diagnosis of cervical dysplasia and HPV was actually kind of like the sounding alarm that I needed to bring my focus and attention here, that So many of us have pain or trauma or adverse experiences or fear regarding our female pelvis, whether that's through sexual, gynecological, or reproductive um, adverse experiences, or even just like the cultural beliefs surrounding being in a female body, like the shame around menstruation, the shame around, you know, maybe our vulvas looking a little different or, you know, like cultural commentary on the way we like our scent (laughs) of, (laughs) um, of like how it changes throughout the time of the month. And so, Pelvic well-being is really about the relationship we have to our female body and particularly the place of our body within the pelvic bowl. And let me tell you, Yasmin, it is a very uh, courageous choice to cultivate pelvic well-being because there is so much housed within the female pelvis that is scary or... um, that brings up a lot of strong emotion, like um, grief or anger or rage, these sorts of things. And yet what I have found is that when we as women choose to go down this path is there's a very powerful reclamation of who we are in this body and confidence is cultivated and um, well-being by way of like health and vitality and a sense of wellness in our life is also cultivated. And so that's really where um, my work focuses. And primarily I like center on the cervix because that's, that was the, my doorway into this work. As I mentioned, I had abnormal pap smears for seven years. And so that that was the kind of like siren going off in my body that my body was saying, you need to have a re- relationship with, with this place within in you, within me. And um, But I, I know that for many women, whether that's ovarian cysts or uterine fibroids or vulvodynia or like any 
women's health diagnosis, that that could be the doorway that we walk through to cultivate this pelvic well-being. Mm, wow. It's so interesting. I mean, how you mentioned how disconnected people are from this the lower portion of their bodies and especially their pelvic bowl and how much is stored in this pelvic bowl and what we sort of need to deal with in order to move through that space and how sometimes these symptoms uh, happen in our life so that we can actually excavate like the root cause of what's going on within us. I, I completely agree. I think many women, anecdotally, this is just my observation, feels like a lot of women don't talk about their anatomy or, you know, what's going on um, until something wrong happens. And so I love, you mentioned uh, this, the abnormal PAPs. Can you talk about what that means for folks lis listening in and also what uh, HPV is? I mean, there's so much to this conversation, but I, I just want to sort of define some of these terms before we move forward. Of course, of course. So um, abnormal PAPs is just short for abnormal PAP smear, which a PAP smear is, I mean, it used to be a yearly exam here in the United States, but I think in many Western countries now they're going to every three years, but it is a... Um, a exam or test where they take a swab and they swab the face of the cervix and right around what's called the cervical oz, or it's like the opening of the cervical canal. And they test that to see if there are any um, abnormal cells developing. And what we know about, like, quote, abnormal cells is if they are not tended to that they can continue to mutate or become even more abnormal, which then creates cancer. And so a pap smear is really a screening for the precancerous condition of what is called cervical dysplasia. And cervical dysplasia is just a really fancy medical term that means abnormal cells on the cervix. So I had seven years of continued pap smears showing abnormal cells on my cervix. And actually it increased over the years to worsen and worsen and worsen to the highest grade of cervical dysplasia, which is called CIN, C-I-N-3. Um, C-I-N is just like a, it's an acronym that has like like it doesn't necessarily that the words in the acronym don't matter because it's just medical jargon. But basically what that was indicating was that I was increasingly showing signs of inching closer and closer to cervical cancer. And I was very young. I was only, um, I had my first abnormal pap smear at 19 and it went all the way up to sin two, sin three when I was 22 almost 23. So I was at the age of 22 and a half facing potential cervical cancer development. Um, and HPV is an acronym for the human papillomavirus, which is uh, a category of virus that is a STI or sexually transmitted infection. And there are, I think at this point, like over 200 strains of HPV, which is pretty incredible. But the, there are a certain, there are a few certain strains of HPV that infect the vaginal canal and space of the cervix that is said to be, um, cancer causing. So if like the viral load increases too much, it can create the abnormal cells leading to the development of cervical cancer. So uh, the most widely known strains are HPV 16 and HPV 18. Although I do believe there's like another number, it's like HPV 45 that it are now saying is cancer causing. Um, but it's a, it's a sexually transmitted infection. And it is said that like 75% of global population is exposed to HPV at some point in their life. So it's not, it's not, um, it's not like outlandish to contract HPV. It's actually very common, but unfortunately for women is there's no, is there's no way to actually know that you have 
contracted HPV until you get a pap smear and until even like signs of cervical dysplasia are showing, although you can have HPV without cervical dysplasia. Um, And the other unfortunate thing is testing for men is almost non-existent. I have heard of some tests like online you can buy for men to see if they have HPV, but HPV 16 and HPV 18 can be carried on their penis and they won't even know because it doesn't affect their body in the same way. And so, um, unfortunately it's just kind of like this like (laughs) dark passenger that, gets passed around sexually. And until it causes an issue in our body, we don't know we have it. Um, so that's why I am, I am actually a proponent for women to get cervical screenings. If they do have multiple partners, or even if you've like been with the same partner for a long time and not like in a monogamous relationship and you have a sudden life event that is very stressful or you also maybe get sick in another way, like another virus. What can be frustrating is that HPV can actually be passed through men without them even knowing it because they can carry the HPV virus on their penis the head of the penis, the shaft of the penis, and not even know that they have it because it doesn't affect them in the same way that affects us. So in a way, it's kind of like this dark passenger that gets passed through, you know, the men and women of the world without anybody knowing until we as women go in to have a pap smear done and it comes back. We have been infected with HPV and perhaps we now are showing this precancerous condition of cervical dysplasia. So I hope that gives um, a little more clarity for your listeners as to what that means. And I, I am really definitely a proponent for women to get the cervical screening because unless we get the screening, we actually don't know that we have HPV. Um, we can, because we don't feel anything, there's no sensation of cervical dysplasia. So, you know, for all of the listeners out there, um, let this be a sign that if you haven't had a cervical screening in a while and you've had had new sexual partners, that it might be a good idea to just get the screening done just so that you know, because there's no way to know that you have cervical dysplasia or HPV unless you get checked. Mm, thank you so much for that. And then, so just, is that is that done through a pap smear, if the cervical screening, or is that something different? Yes. it's So the cervical screening is the pap smear. Got it. Okay, cool. A lot of terminology. <laughs> that... I know, I know. There's so, <laughs> there's so much jargon. <laughs> so uh, Danelle, how does this happen? You know, how do our past lifestyle behavior and choices lead to this? And also like, what's the solution? What can women do now? Mm. Yeah. How does this happen? Well, I'll just speak from my experience. You know, I... When I was diagnosed with HPV at that time in my life, I was in college and I had broken up with my long-term boyfriend like six or seven months prior. And I had decided to have multiple sexual partners and I wasn't very conscious or conscientious conscientious about... (laughs) um, you wearing or using protection because I was on hormonal birth control at the time. So I didn't think that I needed to use a condom and that exposed me to this virus and coupled with living a lifestyle that was very focused on, you know, late nights, um, drinking lots of alcohol, of not really taking care of myself, that just kind of led to the perfect storm of my immune system not being able to overcome the virus or to produce the antibodies to overcome the virus. Because the HPV virus acts exactly the same in our body as any other virus. And so our immune system can, if it's strong enough, um, you know, do what it needs to do to 
fight it off and push it back to the nether regions within your body so it doesn't wreak havoc. And I believe that it lasted so long in my body because I was deeply disconnected from my female body. I had had quite a few traumatic events sexually and reproductively in my life that just completely led me to feel afraid and angry and really resentful about like having a female pelvis. It just had created so much grief in my life that I utilized like drugs and alcohol, just to be frank, to numb myself from, from these past experiences. And so instead of loving my body and, and integrating these experiences and doing like, or seeking out psycho-emotional support to help me integrate these experiences, I just completely dissociated. So, you know, as I was mm, like, facing an increasing level of cervical dysplasia inching me closer to cervical cancer, that's when I realized that I really needed to make a change. And so, you know, the way that I approach cervical health is very multifaceted and, um, in a way like multidimensionally. And what I mean by that is like the lifestyle component of how we are treating our body in a physical sense is very important. So like what your diet is like, are you exercising or moving your body? What are your stress levels like? Are you actually hydrated? Like, do you drink water? (laughs) Do you sleep enough? Do you get enough nature time, like sunlight on your skin and Um, like getting out from behind the screen or like these boxes that we live in, like really getting yourself out into nature and the world, these sorts of things to um, help take care of our physical body. Yet these other levels of cervical health that most of my work honestly is focused on is the psycho-emotional and psycho-spiritual component. And What I find in most of my clients, I'd say like 99% of them, is there are a whole host of past experiences, gynecological, reproductive, or sexual experiences that we just simply haven't addressed in our life. And we reject those parts of ourselves. We reject those past experiences, we try to pretend that they didn't happen or whenever we think of them or have a memory of them, like we dissociate or we try to numb out that memory. And the thing about the cervix, and uh, what I like to say is like cervix is the record keeper of our pelvis. So anything that's happened there, like cervix remembers. And the way that I see the body is that it has, it's intelligent. Like there is intelligence. All of these trillions of cells have intelligence within them, hence our ability to like live and be animated. And so When there is something wrong in the cervix, that to me is like a message trying to come through, like, like, look at me, please face me, like, listen to what is being said here. And it's very unique for each one of us. Um, What I say often is we can all have the same diagnosis, but our pathway that took us there is unique. And what we need to confront and face within ourselves, process, integrate is unique as well. Um, A metaphor that I like to bring forward is that the part of the cervix that becomes dysplasic or produces these abnormal cells is called the face of the cervix, as I mentioned. And the part of the cervix that it starts in more or less is called the mouth of the cervix, or that's also the cervical oz or the opening of the cervical canal. Like those are three ways that you can name it. But the mouth of the cervix, I think is a very interesting name for this place. 
and having the cervical dysplasia to start to develop there. Because the way I see it is like, okay, cervix has a face, cervix has a mouth. Basically, it's just like another one of us just like down below, like in the lower half of our body. And the dysplasia manifesting right around the mouth, it's like the cervix is trying to speak to us. Like the mouth is being like, Hey, (laughs) I need you to come back home here. And we have things we need to work through. So, you know, I just want to offer your um, listeners one tool that I give to all my clients, and that is to create a timeline of your pelvis. And what I mean by that is like on a piece of paper, like starting from age zero to now, go through your memory bank and list out all the experiences that you can remember of your cervix or of your pelvis. So like sexual partners, uh, any sort of reproductive experience like abortion or miscarriage, or birth, um, any sort of gynecological experience. Maybe, you know, you had to go in for different exams or, um, different, you know, experiences in the doctor's office having to do with your female genitalia or female reproductive experience, a female reproductive system and list them all out on a timeline in chronological order if you can. And this might take some time. Like this, like we start to like excavate the the memory bank of our cervix. And what I invite my clients to do is then to like just gaze over this timeline and notice any one of these memories where you cringe, where you try to like turn away from or be like, no, I don't want to remember that. Or like, nope, nope, that didn't happen. Like put a star next to those because those are the things that cervix is really wanting to call to attention to that cervix really demands of us to no longer reject our body, to reject who we are, to reject what we've experienced. And so, you know, the physical components of like having like deeply nourishing foods and making sure we are sweating and and moving our body and sleeping and, and having reduced amount of stress in the best way we can, like that creates the foundation for cervical health. But to truly heal the cervix, what I have found is really bringing our mind back down to our cervix and getting clear about what is there. And I love the word get or the phrase getting clear, because what we want to do is actually have clear pap smears. Like that's the goal. That's the phrase they use in gynecology is like your pap smear is clear. And so we have to get clear about what is held psycho-emotionally within our cervix, within our deep pelvis, and to do the work to process that. And I'm a huge advocate for um, seeking out mental health support to help with that, like somatic therapy or doing um, like somatic embodiment work with a practitioner or in your own way doing it as well. But I, I always just encourage others to... Um, to not try to do this alone, that it can be very confronting. And, um, and it also takes time. I really want to remind everybody that like the healing, the cervical healing journey is not something that happens overnight. So if you are having any sort of cervical health issues that, like it, it's a marathon. We have to like continue to move forward, even if like a month from now it's not better. Like you still have to continue to take care of yourself and continue to um, love yourself into healing. We want to love ourselves into healing, not shame ourselves into changing, and that is very important. So, Danelle, what are some like kind of herbs that people can take uh, to kind of keep keep themselves in a balanced state? within their cervix and then also for those who have HPV. I'm just curious, you know, if you were to, you know, if a woman was supposed, was coming into your clinic 
to talk about just keeping general well-being, what would you recommend to her? And then also if you've got like specific cases, what would you recommend to her? Mm-hmm. Are you talking orally, like specifically like ingesting them? Oh, <laughs> well, well, tell me what's, what's like another way of, um, I guess, ingesting herbs. I, I was thinking maybe the V-steam. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's why I asked for clarity because, um, like topically on the cervix is a a really powerful way via vaginal steaming or even, um, vaginal herbal douching, which I know douches get like a really bad rap, but if someone is faced with cervical dysplasia, especially like high grade cervical dysplasia, doing an herbal douche with like golden seal or golden seal powder, like making like a tea, like a warm tea, pau de arco. I think, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Um, these two are very powerful herbal douches and in vaginal steams, I really recommend things like rosemary and lavender, um, maybe some rose or mugwort. Uh, Calendula is really nice as well. Um, But, you know, I've even heard of women just doing steaming of plain water and what, because what vaginal steaming does is like really pulls, brings blood to the tissue of the pelvis. And it's within the blood that all of the healing components of our body circulates, like the lymphatic system, the immune system. So, um, you know, if if you can only find one of these herbs, that is fine. It doesn't have to be like a a big complicated brew. Um, Orally, like ingesting them, I really love to recommend things like um, liver support herbs, actually. So things like uh, burdock root, nettle, uh, because one, the thing about cervical and pelvic health is it's not just uh, within a vacuum, like it's interconnected to our whole body. And oftentimes, um, we have like other compromised organs that are leading to our body to not be able to send its internal resources to support our cervix. And so what I have found in many of my clients and my, again, myself included is that we have had a like tired, taxed, overburdened liver, or even kidneys, like our our adrenal glands sit right on top of the kidneys. And if we are chugging coffee all day, every day and not eating enough, like we have just like burnt ourselves out. And so our body is just trying to repair the fact that we are burnt out and it can't send like vital resources to our uterus and cervix. So, you know, Orally taking, um, there's one type of uh, supplement, it's called DIM, D-I-M. Um, it's basically a more bioavailable form of folate, uh, but that has been actually clinically proven to help heal cervical cancer. So that is one herbal supplement. It, it's created from cruciferous vegetables. Um, But I also invite, you know, your listeners to look at other herbal supports for the liver and kidneys. So we're like for the kidneys, even like goji berries or calendula nettle is just like an overall good support herb for um, female physiology. Um, And then when you're, when you're bleeding or if you're, um, you know, on your period, like taking things like raspberry leaf and rose or even chamomile um, to support the uterus and to support the cervix through this time of mm, like lessening of energy. Because here's the thing, Yasmin, is we really need to take into consideration how we are treating our body in all levels of our life. And so like uh, herbs Like if we, I don't want us to start taking plants like herbal teas or even supplements as though it's like a, a, 
like a pharmaceutical, like this is a prescription. Like we have to start to think about like how, how is this supporting my, what I'm doing and my behavior in my everyday life? So like if we're super stressed out all the time, like the herb actually will only, you know, barely scratch the surface. So like I, I really encourage women who come to me just be like, okay, well, what supplement, herbal supplement can I take? I'm like, okay, well, here's some suggestions. And like, what else are you doing in your life to mitigate stress or to take care of yourself? Like slow down, maybe lighten your load, these sorts of things. So I'm not trying to diminish the importance of herbs. I just want to make it clear that um, they are a single tool that, um, isn't the end all be all, I guess I want to make clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, absolutely. These are so helpful. Um, just want to say thank you so much for sharing these herb recommendations. I think, um, just, it's great for folks to know what they can, you know, get access to on a regular basis. And then also, um, for healing the cervix. So, uh, hopefully folks have paid attention, but I've got burdock root, nettle for liver support, dim, uh, which is a bioavailable form of folate. You can also find that in cruciferous vegetables. And then nettle tea is an overall good tea for women's health um, when you're on your period, rose, chamomile. And I mean, there's so much more. So you can you can uh, check out the episode again if you want to go back and review some of the, the comments uh, for folks listening. I just want to make, make sure that that's available to them. So Danelle, I want to talk a little bit about your perspective on birth control and if you have knowledge on you know, how birth control can actually affect a woman's um, cervical health and well-being. Mm. Oh, this is a big topic. Um, so I was on hormonal birth control for 10 years and when I was in the phase of healing my cervix where I was doing a lot of research and really committed to healing my body, I actually learned that women who are on hormonal birth control for five or more years are two times more likely to develop cervical cancer. And women who are on hormonal birth control for 10 or more years are three times more likely to develop cervical cancer. So when I saw these statistics, I got really angry, quite frankly, because this was about four years into my diagnosis, four or five years, and not once did any medical provider tell me about the correlation between the hormonal birth control that I was taking. I actually had the implant on, which is like a hormonal implant in the arm. Um, not once did anyone tell me that that was actually making my situation worse. So, you know, it uh, it's a very touchy subject, I believe, but quite frankly, I think that hormonal birth control does more harm than good within our bodies long term. Um, you know, short term, perhaps it can be helpful to, you know, obviously ward off pregnancy. Um However, you know, there's research coming out now about how like uh, women who are taking hormonal birth control to help clear their skin or um, help with, you know, endometriosis pain, that actually what's happening is it's just masking the symptoms. And as soon as they get off of the hormonal birth control, that these symptoms actually come back with a vengeance because nothing has really changed. We just kind of like numbed or silenced the messenger a little bit. So, you know, I've done some research on the history of hormonal birth control and there's some like dark history associated with it regarding eugenics and wanting certain play, you know, certain members of the population to not procreate. And there's quite a few loud voices out there around how um, this has been just kind of like a great global experiment on the female body because we actually don't know, or it's just starting to come out now, what are the long-term effects and ramifications on 
female health for those who have been on hormonal birth control for decades. And so, you know, when clients come to me and they're like, Danelle, do you think I should stop my hormonal birth control? I just tell them the statistic that I said, you know, first, right after you asked the question that women who have been on it for five or more years are two times more likely to develop cervical cancer. And women who have been on it 10 years or more are three times more likely. And that statistic is probably actually old now because it's been, you know, several years since I looked into it. Um, but from my perspective, it's, um, it's taxing on the body to have the hormonal or, or the endocrine system messed with. And it's like we are pulling from the bank of our vitality to put things on pause or to trick our body into believing it's pregnant already. Cause that's what some, you know, birth controls do. It's like it either stops ovulation or it tricks the body into thinking it's already pregnant. Um, so, you know, that just in my mind and my personal belief is that doesn't bode well for long-term health to tr trick the body in that way. And, you know, now we're seeing a huge increase of women with cervical dysplasia. I mean, the amount of people that come to me every day with new diagnoses is overwhelming to say the least. And I be believe that a big part of that is just us having been, you know, given hormonal birth control, like it was no big deal at very young ages. And here we are in our mid twenties to early forties being like, what the heck happened? And, um, I believe this has been one of the causes. Wow. Yeah. I've, I've also heard that. And where did you get that stat from now? The Oh man. Um, this was years ago. I think actually from the CDC, the center of disease control. Wow. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, that's terrifying. Um, so Danelle, I know we're coming at time. I have so many more questions, so uh, we'll have to have you back on the show, but this is so great and so enlightening. Um, what are some of the things that have surprised you the most on your journey? Mm. What has surprised me the most is how when, how when we as women – choose to do this work of healing our relationship with our pelvis, like our pelvic well-being. Like most of the women who come to me, their ages, they're between the ages of like 25 and maybe 50. That the older generations of women, like maybe the baby boomers or even older, like that they are great, so grateful that we're doing this work. Like I've known I've had messages from mothers and grandmothers, I mean, women in my own life who are like, wow, like, thank you for talking about this. Thank you for talking to women about this. I wish I would have known this when I was younger. And so I guess what has surprised me the most is the sense of like hope that is cultivated among the women who choose to go down this path. Like it's not an easy path. I've said that before. It is, it takes a lot of courage to, um, choose to focus on our pelvic well-being and to kind of like overcome the inertia of modern gynecology, trying to funnel us into, you know, certain procedures or outcomes. But when we do choose to overcome that and do choose to, um, act and behave and do things differently in our life on behalf of our female body, like there's a real ripple of influence that happens. And it, it, it comes through in the form of like women talking to the older generations, like their mother or grandmother about things that have never been spoken of before. Like my grandmother, like this Catholic woman from Wisconsin who had like eight children and like never ever spoke about her female body <laughs> ever to me. Um, just even the other month I saw her, she started telling me these stories about herself that I don't think she's ever told anyone before. And so what has surprised me the most is how 
us choosing, what I say, choosing to say yes to our cervix and pelvic well-being, that it opens up the door for more healing than just within our body, but really like the interrelationship between the generations of women. And like I've even had clients tell me that like they now feel comfortable talking to their daughters about this, or they want to do this for their daughters. And I just feel like there's like, it's healing, it's healing a wound on a more like spiritual soul level of like the, the, like our disconnection from other women, our disconnection from like intergenerational community of women. And that's been the most surprising. I didn't expect that when I started this, uh, seven years ago. And, um, it's been really heartwarming to witness. Wow. Amazing. So Danelle, what do you want to tell our audience about your main takeaway? What's the call to action? If you know, folks are listening in, what do you want to tell the listeners right now about what to do next? Hmm. Well, if you are wondering like, oh my gosh, I want to like know more about the cervix. I want to start connecting to cervix. Um, I actually have a free resource on my website. It's under the banner free content library. But if you go there, there's an amazing video that I made that's like cervix 101. And there's like a meditation there. But I really invite and encourage everyone like to do one thing a day on behalf of their deep pelvis, on behalf of their pelvic well-being, on behalf of their cervix. So whether that's like just like bringing conscious awareness to something during the day on behalf of your pelvis, it can even be like, I'm going to make myself a cup of tea just for my pelvic well-being, or I'm going to go out into the garden and pick a flower, like, and this is an honor of my body. Um, Or it can be having a conversation with women in your life, like another woman in your life, be like, hey, like, I really want to talk about this more. Like, what is, like, here's an experience I have had. What is an experience you've had? So like, just to start to, to thaw the ice around the connection with our body, and the connection of just like being a female on this planet. And again, if you're just wanting some like, like primer things to do on my website, there's a free content library that I highly recommend you checking out. And, um, just to start small and just to start, just start somewhere. Mm. doesn't have to be perfect. doesn't have to be like all ceremonial or anything like that. Just something small every day. Wonderful. And Danelle, where can people find you? Yeah, my website is www.cervicalwellness.com. And I'm also fairly active on Instagram. My handle is at cervical wellness. And those are the two main places that you can find me. Amazing. Okay. And we'll leave that in the show notes. Danelle, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciated this conversation. I learned a lot and I'm sure that folks listening in will take your advice to heart and uh, really re-examine their lifestyle and their relationship with their pelvic bowl. Thank you. And for our audience, thanks for joining and for listening in this episode. We learned about cervical wellness with Danelle, Barbara, Randall, and you can tune in to Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one conversations with leading experts in wellness, well-being, and spirituality. Thanks again.